What is thorium? Why thorium? Why is thorium something that we haven't really heard about until now? Yeah, it's uh, been known since the beginning of the nuclear age that there are two kinds of material that can become fuel. They're not fissionable without help, mm -hmm. but if you add a neutron to them, they become fissionable. One is uh, a kind of uranium, which is more abundant than the ones that we fission mm -hmm. today by a factor of 100, and that's the one that is used to make plutonium, which is fissionable. Thorium is the other material which, when you add a neutron to it, becomes a lighter version of uranium, which is also fissionable. And it is four times abund as abundant as the abundant form of uranium. So, so if it's something that, that we can use for the nuclear process to create energy, if it's something that has been stockpiled, if it's something that's everywhere, why has it not been an integral part of the process? Uh, it, because there's already an established infrastructure that takes natural uranium and enriches it to make it more abundant in the U-235 instead of U-238. And that infrastructure exists and they want to keep going. All right. But if you put in enough effort, you could, in principle, transform to a thorium cycle rather than this uranium-plutonium cycle that we currently are on. Is the fact that there's a lot more of it around, is that the only benefit? Is that the major benefit of, of moving to thorium? No, it's also much cleaner because since it's much lighter than plutonium, you don't actually make much plutonium. Very little plutonium results from this kind mm. of reactor. And whatever there is, you just keep circulating until it's gone. So this kind of reactor would never produce weapons-grade plutonium. Are, are you making sure there's not a, uh, not a meltdown? Okay, so there's not a meltdown because the salt is already molten. So in some sense, you've already planned for the meltdown. You're operating under meltdown conditions. So the thing you're actually afraid of is freeze-ups where the salt becomes cold and dropped below its melting point, which is very easy since a melting point is like four or 500 C or 1000 F, okay, Fahrenheit. So once it gets out of the reactor, there's no more heat. There's no more heat from nuclear energy. It starts to cool, it will freeze. So we designed the rest of the plant in such a way it will freeze in less than 10 seconds. So before it can get out of this room, you know, it's on the floor, it's, <laughs> it's frozen. Mm -hmm. So that means it's immobilized, all right? Just the opposite of what you're afraid of in regular nuclear power plants where you design something to be solid and now it's gone beyond your design and become molten. That can flow. Molten, yes, inside the core, inside the pool can flow. Once it gets out, it's frozen. It is not going anywhere. This is a module of an entire nuclear uh, reactor core where all the fission reactions mm -hmm. would take place. And it is uh, designed for a molten salt reactor, a so-called two-fluid molten salt reactor, where the uh, special uranium fuel, uranium-233, is carried in tubes to this port, goes down through holes that are drilled mm -hmm. in nuclear-grade graphite, and then meets the bottom, plenum, is turned around and goes back up where it's uh, pumped, cycled through. And meanwhile, the salt, there's a second salt, which um, sits in a big pool surrounding this whole thing. And uh, it passes through channels, holes that are drilled in this direction without the two hitting each other. So they uh, are separated by graphite walls. So they're two separate uh, flows that are going on. One which is actually being pulled from an open pool through here uh, carrying thorium. And because nuclear reaction, fission reactions are occurring in the fuel, excess neutrons are irradiating the so-called blanket salt and turning the thorium into uranium-233 that can then be put into the fuel. Oak Ridge, which invented this process 60 years ago, never built a breeder. Nobody has ever built a breeder of any kind that has worked well. Mm. Okay, plutonium breeders come closest, but this kind of breeder has never been built. All forms of graphite, any form of carbon, is a very clean source of slowing down neutrons. Mm -hmm. It slows them down 
by colliding with them without absorbing them. So for a breeder reactor, because it's neutrons that are transforming thorium into usable fuel, you want to be as economical with those neutrons as possible. And that means there's only two kinds of materials which are very, very economical in not absorbing neutrons while still slowing them down. One is heavy water, which is ordinary water, except the hydrogen is replaced by heavy hydrogen or deuterium. And the other is graphite. Right? Those are the only two kinds of materials that are very efficient. So we're using the reactor in multiple ways. First, as containment and channels for the fuel salt, but also to moderate, to help moderate the neutrons, to slow them down so they become more effective. You don't need as many of them. Uh, okay, you don't need as much fuel. So it's very conserving of fuel. So uh, if you look at total household usage, the rule of thumb is it's about a kilowatt per person. Okay, so if you have a household of four, you would need four kilowatts. So each unit could uh, generate, on average, about one megawatt of power. If you had a three by three by three configuration, you would have 27 of them, and that would be 27 megawatts. But if you had 10 by 10 by 10, that would be a thousand, that would be a gigawatt.